Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard.
my soul and let us journey on before the night is done and I am far from home oh thanks be to God the morning light of So
It's dark. The world lies in sin and error pining. The shadows are conspiring, but a light is coming. The Lord has been quiet for four centuries. The prophets are gone. There are no signs to see. It's silent. But let me tell you something. A voice is coming. The patriarchs are long dead. The judges were traded for a bunch of crowned heads. This monarchy, though, consistently failed and misled. No system is working. But there's a new king coming. Man's dead in religion. Legalism reigns. Ceremonial acts which are just simply profane. The law is not working. But a new covenant is coming. The people are defiling. The rituals God is despising. Even the priests are compromising. And the sin offerings, they're worthless sacrificing. Oh, but get ready because a lamb is coming. The temple is a den of thieves. A brood of vipers are the Pharisees. Same too for the Sadducees. They don't even know there's a new high priest coming. The nations are suffering. Evil is chuckling. And the faithful are left wondering, does God even care? Oh, let me tell you something. Emmanuel is coming. God's people desire a glorious king. The world is yearning for eternity. A perfect sacrifice each soul desperately needs. It's a silent night, but hope is in sight. A most precious gift God is bestowing. The Bethlehem star begins glowing. Let the good news start growing. A baby is coming. Greetings, everyone. I'm Jasmine Valencia, and I'd like to share some information about giving financially at our church. Before we talk about how to give, let's talk about where it goes. Whenever you give to the Potomac Valley Church, you'll have three options to specify where that money goes. General Operations, which supports our church's operating expenses. Benevolence, which we save separately in order to provide for members in crisis or community members who come to us in need. And lastly, missions, which is the most wide-reaching category that serves needs locally and abroad with our family of churches and the communities we serve. Now that we know where your financial gift will go, let's talk about how to give. For those of you prepared to give today, you can give online through your own bank using the bill pay function. You can give using easy and secure payments through our church center mobile app. Finally, you can mail your own check or money order to our church office and payments will be processed through our bank weekly. If you missed anything or need additional details and clarification, you can find all of this and more on our website at www.potomacvalleychurch.com forward slash give. Thank you for your participation and heart to serve with a financial gift today. Good morning, church. 
Welcome to the Potomac Valley Online Digital Worship Service and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. As you are watching this, you would have celebrated Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with family and friends and so hopefully you've had a great holidays and a great 2021 and we are so grateful that you've decided to join us and if you've been joining us for some time, you know that 2021 has been an incredible year for our world, for our nation. Also, it's been an incredible year for the Potomac Valley Church as well as we have resumed in-person services. We've met congregationally in Fredericksburg. From Fredericksburg, we were sent out and now we have two physical campuses that are meeting in, in Woodbridge and also, of course, in Fredericksburg. We have two buildings, one in Dumfries, one in Fredericksburg. And so God has been moving in incredible ways as the world continues to be volatile and as the world is constantly changing the church as well. We're constantly adapting and innovating and trying to get acclimated and adjusted to all the changes that are taking place. But thankfully, God's gospel remains constant and we have continued to teach and preach the gospel as we've moved into functioning, true functioning, small groups. And this year, this whole year, we've been primarily been focused on what, what it, does it mean to be healthy and what does hospitality look like? Hospitality for the holidays in particular, as for the month of December, we've primarily been parked out in the Gospel of Luke. And, and it's been a fantastic time to look at the Gospel of Luke, as many consider the Gospel of Luke to be the Christmas Gospel. And so we're going to continue that on, and we're going to end out 2021 looking at the Gospel of Luke in a very great way, as Jesus has just been born. And now we're going to look at Jesus at the temple and see what God's Holy Spirit would reveal to us this morning. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 22 through 40 of Luke chapter 2, and hopefully you guys are, are with me. But again, in Luke chapter chapter 2, Jesus has just been born, and Luke's gospel has primarily been focused on a lot of these historical figures, but in particular, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and of course, Mary and Joseph. And here in Luke chapter 2, Jesus has just been born, and now Mary and Joseph are going to make this 140-mile journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem so that they can dedicate Jesus, which would have been a very common practice at the time. Let's read it together. Luke chapter 2, verse 22. It says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, for which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your soul too. There was a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She had never left the temple but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying, Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong and was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And we stopped there. You know, what a, an incredible passage as 
We see many characters here. We see the baby Jesus, we have Mary, we have Joseph, we have Anna, and of course we have Simeon. And here the Bible starts out that the time came for the purification rites, and Mary and Joseph send Jesus and make this journey about 140 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Jesus probably would have been six weeks old. If you've ever had a baby, if you've had children, at six weeks, they're primarily mostly crying. Traveling is hard. You don't want to go anywhere. You don't even know when day and night is, day of the week is. I remember when Connor was uh, six weeks old, when Elizabeth was six weeks old, I had forgotten when the last time I showered. I had forgotten what day of the week it was. I had forgotten what night and day looked like and what a 24-hour day looked like and felt like. And obviously, it's insane. And here, they make this trip would have taken roughly a week from Jerusalem, from Nazareth to Jerusalem. And, and they do that to dedicate Jesus. And they do that to, 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 to follow this tradition as it's written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male will be consecrated to the Lord. And they offer up Jesus to be dedicated at this temple. Now, it, it would have been a very familiar journey for them. And every, every Jew and every Israelite who would make this journey to the temple, they would be uh, an honor. As they would get to the temple, they would be singing songs of praise, singing songs of praise, because they were climbing up these steps and getting closer and closer to where God dwelled. And then we could be closer and closer to where God met man. That's how big of a deal the temple of God was. And that's how big of a deal what they were doing was in going to the temple following this tradition. Not only that, the Bible says in verse 39, Mary and Joseph had done everything required by the law of the Lord, and they returned their home to Galilee of Nazareth. And, and the big deal is that Mary and Joseph are upright people. They're following God. They're doing what's right. It's incredible because these are Jesus' parents, and most likely this set an example for Jesus. Who would be uh, who is the son of god and they do all this because they just want to do what's right and upon entering the temple they encounter of course anna and simeon simeon here who was anna both anna and simeon are both older simeon here the bible says was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit had revealed to him he would not die before seeing Emmanuel, seeing Jesus Christ, seeing the Messiah. And of course, I love what he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may dismiss me now in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. And what I love about this passage about Simeon, and what I love about Luke's gospel overall, is there's so many highlights of the work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 25 uh, it said, the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. Verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Verse 27, moved by the Holy Spirit. And so all throughout Simeon's life and all throughout this passage describing Simeon is the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and really what's taking place in our lives right now in eternity past, eternity future, and in the present moment is the work of the Holy Spirit. I know that you've had some, many of us have had a rough 2020 and a rough 2021, but all of the bad and all of the good and everything in between is the work of the Holy Spirit. The fact that wicked men, wicked women nailed Jesus on the cross, that is a bad thing, but that's also the work of the Holy Spirit because of what it would accomplish, the saving of many lives. All the good, the bad, it's all God's providence. It's all God's sovereignty, and it's all the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the reason why you became a Christian was the work of the Holy Spirit. You might not have received the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was working in your life, setting the times and places for people to meet you, people to greet you, for you to be born, for people to be born, for events and circumstances, even bad ones, divorces and, and affairs and adulteries, all the good and all the bad. All that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The fact that we are in a global pandemic and that things may be getting worse according to some sources and may not be getting better. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit because God is still in control and God is still moving in your life. And the church 
is still the work of God and the church is still moving and the Holy Spirit is still moving despite things may be closing you cannot close down on the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is still working in your life you know I think of it I've described it many times of an illustration like a loom you know uh, but, uh, if you look at the loom if you look at the loom I mean it, it's got all these fabric and all these different colors going haywire going crazy if you look below the loom and that's what our lives look like people moving and going transitioning a mourning grieving celebrating there's a lot of chaos going on in the world right now and that's that's where we are we can't make sense of the comings and goings we don't really know what's happening when people are moving we don't really know what's happening when bad things are taking place we don't really know what's happening as we're grieving we don't know what's happening as we're celebrating because we below, live below the loom and it just looks like chaos and makes no sense and there's no order but god lives above the loom god sees this beautiful tapestry being made god weaves all the good and the bad in between to create his will to create a redemption story for all of us to create a redemption story for mankind god used the evil of judas and wicked men wicked women to bring about the the death of Jesus, of course, because that will bring about the resurrection of Jesus, where we get to enjoy this new covenant and the forgiveness of sins. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit had been involved in Simeon's life up to this point. He gets to hold Jesus and see Jesus. Of course, we also meet Anna. I love how the Bible describes Anna. She is a righteous woman. She had only been with her husband, the Bible says, for seven years i believe after her marriage and then she was a widow until 84 she's a faithful woman of god she represents a widow she represents a single woman uh, of course and 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 she just represents someone who is devout she worshiped night and day fasting and praying and she was also glad to see jesus all of this taking place at the temple now why is this so significant that this takes place at the temple and i want to talk about this this temple idea because the temple as i've alluded to earlier would have been a very big deal to mary and joseph to all jews because the temple was where god met man the temple was where you would go to get your sins atoned for the temple where the most holy of holies that's where god dwelled that's where the holy spirit resided I mean, God wanted a home and he asked Solomon to build him a home and that home would be the temple. So God resided there. God's Holy Spirit resided there. It was a place that was where God met man, where, where God would forgive men and women's sins. It would also be the center for fellowship. It would be the center where you would go to, to commune with your community. Uh, for the Israelites, it would have been for other fellow Jews and Israelites. You would, you would go and you would have a, uh, a, a basically church, essentially. That's where you would connect. And so that's, that was like the center for worship, for fellowship, for God met man, for community. It would have been a big deal. It would have been a big deal. Obviously, we don't have a temple now. We'll talk more about what that may potentially mean later. But when Jesus enters the scene and he goes to temple, the temple here, it really ushers in a new era and a new covenant because we have the temple model of religion that will be superseded by what Jesus does. And because the temple model of worship and the temple model of religion is described by four main things. There would be a sacred place with the sacred text with sacred people and you have sincere or superstitious or scared followers and in the temple model of worship you have the sacred place which is this temple you have the sacred text which would have been the Old Testament the law the prophets the writings and you have your sacred people which would have been the the the, the priests and then you got the sincere superstitious often illiterate followers and often scared followers and so you would go to the temple the sacred place where you would have meet sacred men or sacred people or sacred women who would interpret the sacred text for you and you as a superstitious and sincere or scared follower you would just have to do what they say 
Now, this is not just unique to Judaism or even Christianity, but this is the temple model of worship for a lot of religions. And in fact, I would argue all religions, Judaism, Islam, uh, all sorts of other world religions out there, you have a sacred people with a sacred text in a sacred place, and you have scared, superstitious, or sincere followers. Now, the reason why this is such a big deal is because when you, when you live according to this temple model, you grant a lot of power. You grant a lot of power to the sacred people, the sacred men, the sacred women. Because anyone who can tell you, if you don't do this, then you will go to hell. Or if you don't do this, you will not be right with God. And if you don't do this, you will be shamed or punished. That grants that person a lot of power. Now, here is the big deal. Here is the big deal. When Jesus enters the scene, he is not continuing something that is already existing. Jesus enters the scene and he is saying, I am doing something completely brand new. He's not continuing the Old Testament. He is fulfilling the Old Testament and he is doing something completely brand new. And therefore, when Jesus enters the scene, he ushers in the new covenant. He says, there will be no more sacred place. The temple is destroyed, okay? It was destroyed in 70 AD because we don't need it anymore. Jesus will teach there will be no more sacred place because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, you are a temple and I am a temple and your brother and sister is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so what's holy is no longer a patch of dirt, a piece of land. What's holy is that brother and sister to your right and left that brother and sister behind you and in front of you, that person who follows Jesus, they will be considered holy and they will be more important than a patch of dirt or a piece of land. And that we, the Holy Spirit, would decide to reside in our body and no longer a physical place that it would be better that Jesus left because then if he hadn't left, he wouldn't be able to send his Holy Spirit to come upon us and also to reside on in us. So there would be no more sacred place. There will also be no more sacred texts because Jesus will replace the sacred text and fulfill the sacred text and it will all be fulfilled with one command, love. Love. John 13, Jesus says, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Matthew 22, we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as we love ourselves. So the whole Bible, all the old, all the new is fulfilled by love. You see, law keeping would be replaced by love. Animal sacrifice would be replaced by self-sacrifice. Keeping rules would be about, not no longer about keeping rules, but it'd be about keeping a relationship with God. And so God would rid, and Jesus, when he does something brand new, he would rid of the sacred places. He would rid of the sacred text. He would also be rid of sacred men and sacred women as well. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says that we are all ministers and there were all a holy priesthood. That means there will be no more clergy, lady, divide. There are no priests that is over and above a sincere, scared, or superstitious followers. We are all followers of Jesus and we are all ministers of Jesus and we are all ministers of a new covenant. That means that you can confess your sins to me as I can confess my sins to you. You can minister to me as I can minister to you. There is no more second class or first class citizen because there are no classes. We are all sinners. We're all in need of God's grace and we're all in need of God's forgiveness. And we all get to forgive one another, minister to one another, and care for one another, and counsel one another. And we are all on the same playing field now. So, so when Jesus enters the scene, he destroys the temple model of leadership. No more sacred places, no more sacred texts, no more sacred men and women. We are all the same. And so when Jesus enters the scene, he's not continuing something that has already started before. He's doing something brand new. Now, that being said, we still go back to our old ways. And we still go back to the default model of religion. Going back to a sacred place, a church building, looking at a sacred text, and following a sacred man and woman. 
This is why we ask things like, well, is this, how far can I get in this without actually sinning? And that tells me you really want to get close to sin and not getting close to Jesus. That's why we get more concerned about missing church than we are about not being engaged in God's body, which tells me we're more concerned about us instead of other people. That's why we get more, feel morally superior when other people sin instead of having our hearts break that they hurt God. That's why we're so concerned with what we got to do after we sin and making that right instead of the God that we hurt and the God's heart that we break. So we're also still concerned about self instead of God. Now, this is a big deal because Jesus comes on earth and lives the life we couldn't live, dies the death that we had to die, and gives the gift that we cannot earn. And he destroys this old model to usher in something brand new. And we get to enjoy this incredible new covenant. This incredible new covenant where there will be no more animal sacrifice, it'll be self-sacrifice. Where there would be no more rule keeping, it would be about a relationship with God. It would be no more about observing traditions, but about observing Jesus. We get this new covenant. We get this new covenant that we get to enjoy where our sins are forgiven. And of course, as I mentioned, the temple would have been destroyed in 70 AD because we don't need it anymore. We don't need it anymore. The temple is superfluous. The temple is irrelevant now because now the Holy Spirit resides in you and the Holy Spirit resides in me. And we have the Holy Scriptures together to learn and read it and study it and meditate on it and apply it together now. So the big point, I know I said a lot, big point is enjoy the new covenant. Enjoy life with Jesus. Enjoy it. I know that it, it, whenever it feels burdensome, whenever it feels tiresome, whenever it feels heavy, and you're not enjoying it, it's because you've gone back to the old temple model of religion instead of the new covenant that Jesus wants you and I to enjoy. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.15, there's one mediator between man and God. That's Jesus Christ. No person, no church, no building, no sacred person, no sacred whatever can mediate you and God except Jesus Christ. And that is the new covenant. We have a high priest who is tempted in every way, but yet was without sin. We have a high priest who loves us and knows us and goes in and becomes the sacrifice for us so that we can live this incredible life to the full that Jesus has given to us. So enjoy the new covenant. And as we look forward to 2022, I don't know what that brings, but I do know this. We need to follow the Holy Spirit. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if things will get better, things will get worse. I don't know if COVID continues. I don't know if new variants will pop up. I don't know if things will get better, things will get worse, things will open up, things will close. Anyone that tells you they know, they're lying or they're being deceived or they're being naive. Nobody knows but God. And that, therefore, we're just living our days day by day. And I think of the Israelites when they were walking in the wilderness. They were led by God, fire by night, cloud by day. And they were just following the Spirit of God. And for us, there is no more temple where we can find the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is in you, the Holy Spirit's in me. And so moving forward in 2022, Potomac Valley Church, Rappahannock Campus, Prince William Campus, we'll be following the Holy Spirit. We'll follow the Holy Spirit wherever it leads us, wherever it guides us and we will follow its direction. And wherever its direction leads us, 
that will be the place where we find life to the full. That will be the place where Jesus is. That will be the place where we find grace, mercy, and love. And that's where we will, that will be the place where we find God. So my encouragement to you, enjoy the new covenant. Enjoy the fact that the Holy Spirit is in us. Let's follow the Holy Spirit. Let's enjoy the new covenant. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year.